my home state of Michigan when uh, European settlers got here in the early 1800s. Um, there were Indians here and they lived peacefully by that time. Um, there was one tribe, I gotta tell you this, show you with the Michigan map. It's always very handy. So here we go. That's Michigan. And we are right here at Lumberman's Monument. Indians, for hundreds of years, had tribes here and here living peacefully. And in the middle region, they had tri uh, one single tribe that was just nasty. Just nasty. And, uh, you know, the woods were very good places for ambush. So anywhere near their territory, or going through it on a trail that uh, everyone had agreed was to be used for trade, there were all kinds of ambushes and, and killings and atrocities. So these two tribes communicated, got together, and they wiped out the bad guys. That's amazing. That was hundreds of years before the white settlers got here. And once they did, they started chopping down the trees. And uh, by then they were trading at Detroit mostly with, um, with French trappers. Uh, no, the French, uh, yeah, I guess they were, but they were, the Indians knew that they could get a bunch of cash by getting their furs down river and the white men would buy them. So they were, there was a lot of trade. Uh, the tribes were basically peaceful because of this purge when the white man got there. And so I don't know how they treated the uh, Indians. And let's get this clear. I have talked to a lot of Indians and they don't want to be called Native Americans. So that's what I'll refer to them as. Anyway, so this, these are the type of people that uh, started cutting down the forest, the great stands, the natural resources of Michigan. Then they moved to Wisconsin and Minnesota. So it was a wave of loggers coming across the country, starting on the eastern forests, the hardwood forests. They had log drives there too. But what these guys would do with the tools that you see, they would go out in the forest as a crew, and some would survey and some would use a PV to move these logs for loading or getting them down to the river in the great piles before the log drive when the, the spring thaw would come along. And this guy has this saw. Isn't that cool? It's a two-man and they had to crouch pretty low because the value of the tree was uh, affected if they wouldn't uh, bend their backs and, and saw as low to the ground as they can, which would lengthen the length of the log. That's a red pine. And there's a white. You see how different feathery boughs? Isn't that beautiful? This is the overlook. There's a dam downstream that formed this lake with islands. There's a log cabin, the pile of logs. They've all been peeled. It looks like they're pressure treated. Doesn't matter. I gotta tell you a story. When I was a young man, I went to college for a year and then I decided it really wasn't for me. At least at this point, maybe I would come back. But it took a year off and I worked on the line at Ford Motor Company, putting tie rods in the uh, F100, 150, 200, 250 trucks. It was fun working there on the line. And I made some friends and they, I guess, were from this area. One night they said, you want to go camping with us? And I said, well, okay, sure. Because we had talked camping before. And we wound up the next night. Actually, it was more towards dawn because we worked the night shift at Ford. I brought my sleeping bag the next day, piled in. They had tents and everything. And they had axes. We camped on that ridge up there, and there were no campsites. Now there are. I guess it's the National Park Service has put a whole bunch, and you've got to sign in and register and follow their rules. There were no rules. And these guys had worked a, a summer together 
on some government program out west where they were to uh, go into the forest and naturally thin them with axes. So you take like every fifth tree um, because when the trees are spread out they grow so much faster and healthier and that means they're less prone to insect damage and stuff. So anyway, we're camped on that ridge in three feet of snow. They brought a toboggan for our gear and we pulled it like we were horses through the snow, no trail, and uh, we had a keg of beer. I think it was Bud. It was Budweiser. This is this is 40 years ago. One of the guys got so drunk he slid down that hill. Uh, but the snow was crusty like it is now, and so he could he could dig in his boots as he was going down, and that kept him from really being injured because that is a serious drop. That island is shaped like a horseshoe. You can see from that ridge. Anyway, he had a dog named Cinder, black lab, very old, had his dog bowl right next to the fire. And we had a huge fire because these guys loved to chop. There was tons of wood downed in that forest and they just made the, the three feet of snow. It was probably 20 feet uh, with no snow because of the warmth from that fire. We kept going all weekend and it was fun. But the dog, the dog was old and he'd sit by the fire on his blanket and uh, they had a dog bowl and his owner would fill it with Budweiser and the dog would just sit there and <laughs> True story I had a dog, I'd give him Budweiser. Most of the lumbermen were immigrants, and so there was a, a language barrier, and there was also a lot of turmoil between the different ethnicities. So they had these uh, mess halls where they would feed all the lumberjacks in the morning, and uh, then send them out for the day. There were four major meals a day, and it was a huge part of their pay because think how much energy it takes to chop and saw all day. And uh, so you burn a t t tons, tons and tons of calories. And these guys were in awesome shape. And they were proud of it. And, uh, but the, uh, the standard deal for working was a very low wage, except that it included meals. And that was what drove the lumbermen. And that the cook had to be really good and all his crew. They had a ton of power with the people who ran the lumber camps. Because if they weren't doing their job right, the lumberjacks would walk off. And uh, they would sign up for a season's work at a lumber camp based on how good the cook was. And they were ranked too, the lumberjacks, where they had uh, the lumber camps knew the bad guys and would kick them out. And uh, they, uh, this is funny, you think about all the uh, mob movies. It was standard practice in many lumber camps that they would not hire Italians because they were too quarrel quarrelsome. <laughs> and all the Irish, I'm Irish so I could say this, and uh, there won't be any politically correct backlash because the Irish aren't wimps. But they didn't like the rule that you couldn't drink at a lumber camp. So they formed their own lumber camps and there was a lot of drinking. <laughs> anyway, so... 
all these ethnicities. The standard rule at the mess hall was no talking. You're supposed to be shoveling food in your mouth anyway. It was all family style. So you'd have pies on the table already cut. You'd have everything you can think of that's delicious but probably unhealthy is what they ate because they were burning calories like like we don't have in our society except for like Olympic athletes training. It was amazing. Anyway, so the cooking culture in any state where they had logging camps and these rules and the cooks had the head cook had so much power over the logging camp uh, that uh, the food had to be good and it had to be huge quantities and uh, so the cooks dominated the kitchen and so I don't know how it is in every other state uh, where they didn't have this giant logging industry come through for a hundred years doing their thing in their own way. Um, maybe they're a little uh, nicer in other in other kitchens but they're rough and rowdy in uh, the kitchens I've worked at in Michigan over the many many years. I am the only cook I ever met that has never been busted for drunk driving. It's just sort of a thing that the cooks... Uh, there are some restaurants where they still have a tradition where you work a shift. If they have a bar connected to the restaurant you get a shift beer for every shift you work. So it's a way of uh, keeping the cooks uh, happy, rewarding them, so they can go in and order a free beer after a shift. The shift beer is part of the culture that, uh, that have, has evolved from the Michigan lumber camps. But that shift beer couldn't have been right because there was no drinking allowed. That would probably apply to the cook crew, not just the lumberjacks themselves, which were actually called shanty boys because they lived in shanties that they would build as a lumber camp got set up with the raw materials that they needed, which was these uh, the trees all around us. This was logged and it's been growing back for, I don't know, 80 years, maybe 100. It's a beautiful heritage for my home state.